Um, so let's get started right away. Uh, we have some people here, faculty, and a whole bunch of people on YouTube. And it's a great privilege and a very happy day for me to uh, welcome Mark Watson. I met Mark when I was a first year graduate student. Um, that was a while ago. Uh, but those of you who are first year graduate students or remember being one uh, will recall what a sucky experience that is. And Mark is, uh, you know him as a phenomenal economist, econometrician, but he's a doubly phenomenal teacher and a quadruply phenomenal human being. Uh, he was one of the few people who made me feel that, you know, maybe uh, I may actually belong there and am not a lost cause. And um, I, you have a special place in my heart. So, so it really is wonderful to see you. And this is a poor substitute for a real visit. And we are still looking forward to that. But until then, we'll make do. So it's a regular seminar. We will heckle and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Great, 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 great. OK, well, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, uh, and, and great to see Rafet and you know, all of the, the rest of you here. Um, uh, um, I too uh, would much rather be there in person, but uh, you know, it turns out this is really easy, but uh, but not nearly as good. Um, so uh, so we'll put that off for another day. Um, so I'm um, I'm going to talk about this paper with um, with Forster, Hornstein, and um, Pierre Sart. Um, so let me share my screen, and then I'll just you know we'll just get to work here. Um, Okay, so you guys, can I see a thumbs up? Can you guys see this? Yep, okay, great, great, great. Okay, so um, let me do a couple of things. Um, uh, this is the first time I've actually given this paper, um, even though it's been around a little bit. It's the first time I've given it in a seminar. I gave it at a, at a conference or two. Um, you know, those are short um, uh, presentations. You'll, you'll notice that I am um, technically challenged when it comes to uh, preparing slides. Um, I decided to shift to a different way of preparing slides. And of course, I, I decided to make that big shift yesterday about 4 p.m. Um, and, uh, you know, things didn't work out quite right. So these slides are going to be um, a little, um, you know, not nearly as fancy as you might expect to see. But I think they have all of the, the meat um, or all of the ideas that I wanted to get across here. Uh, the other thing is, um, I should say, you know, I hadn't even looked at this paper since, you know, I guess, you know, last um, April, we're in the middle of uh, revising it now. Um, and I was um, um, uh, quite surprised at how long the paper was, uh, given the fact that it has uh, uh, the number of pages uh, per idea is uh, our number of ideas per page, I guess, is very small number of pages per idea is very large. Um, so the, the, the paper, uh, they're really just a couple of ideas um, and a couple of results in the paper. And that's what I want to go through. Um, it's not clear to me why that required whatever it was, uh, 45 pages or something, because it's a, it's a pretty simple um, exercise that we're going to go through. Um, I should, um, uh, as my um, uh, colleagues, our co-authors would um, uh, insist, you know, I should, um, uh, make this disclaimer that the views herein are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, San Francisco, the Federal Reserve System, um, or necessarily uh, even Mark Watson. So, uh, so we'll just um, we'll just move along here. Okay. So let me tell you let me tell you the motivation for this paper, and then and then we'll just we'll get to it. And uh, you know, please interrupt with. Um, uh, questions, comments, et cetera, right as we go through this. So um, this is a pre-COVID paper. Um, so we're going to look at data that run from, you know, 1950 through uh, 2018. Um, and uh, the data I'm showing you here are is um, the, the growth rate of U.S. GDP. Um, it's really not quite U.S. GDP its value added in the ex-government sector, um, so in the private economy. And the reason is because we're going to look at some sectoral data later on uh, that doesn't have government in it. We're going to want it to add up to this particular measure. So this is, um, you know, for those of you that have used these data, this is the sort of CLEMS data set. Um, 
And uh, so these data are annual. And, um, you know, here is just the annual growth rate of, um, you know, in percentage points uh, per year of, of GDP growth, right? You can see, you know, it sort of looks like that or something, right? If you look at the, the growth rate, I've kind of helped with that, you know, that curve, if you will, by forming 11 month, excuse me, 11 year uh, centered moving averages over here, right? And you can see this basic, you know, fact, at least through about 2018, right? There was kind of this secular decline, right? In the average growth rate. Um, for most of this data, what we're gonna do, is, excuse me, for most of this talk, what we're gonna do is take some of the noise um, out of this, you notice the side, you know, this, this range is from, you know, minus five to 10. Um, you can filter out some of the business cycle, if you will, by, uh, if you will, just regressing GDP growth on some leads and lags of the change in the unemployment rate. That gets rid of some of the um, volatility. So you can see now, right, this is from minus one to six. So we've reduced some of the variability in it, right? And, and when you form, you know, the equivalent 11 year centered moving averages of this, right? You get really the same pattern, the same picture, but we've denoised it a little bit, okay? So what are we interested in here? Well, we're interested in kind of understanding, right? The sources of this decline in, um, in, the, in the growth rate, right? So here are the numbers, right? If you can see this, uh, the data are gonna stop in 2018 because that's the last year in which we have these uh, sectoral data. Uh, that was a little note to myself uh, to, um, to point that out, right? And uh, here are the two data series. This is GDP, kind of the raw uh, data. And here are the cyclically adjusted versions. This just takes out again, those leads and lags of the unemployment rate. So this was the first set of figures. Uh, and the second set of figures that we looked at, right? But you can see regardless of, of which of these that you look at, right? You see, you know, on average, uh, GDP growth was about 3.2%, right? But it, it varied, you know, it was high in the beginning and then it was flat, right? And then it fell to about 1.8, right? So this is gonna be the explaining or getting some insights into what caused this um, is, is the exercise that we're going to uh, conduct here. Can I ask a quick question? I mean, th th this is, of course, a, you know, like glorious, old, big, huge literature uh, yep. internationally, too. Yep. And I have a question about the cyclical adjustment in that um, there are two separate things here, right? One is the cyclical adjustment, which I would have done in a more, you know, unsophisticated manner, just some trend cycle decomposition, something, something, right? Yep. Yep. Which will yep. probably look very much like this. Yep. Um, but then I would also ask, okay, um, you know, there is a, in, in a sense, uh, there is a factor utilization or um, factor input story to this. Um, and then there is a TFP growth story to this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in general, when we think about these things, we often assume it's all TFP. But when we look at this longer history in the U.S., it certainly isn't. It's things like, you know, female labor force participation and some, you know, major shifts of that yeah. sort has happened. Yeah. So are you going to tell us a story on those things? Just yeah. Keep... Yeah. Yes. I'm happy. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm not going to tell you a story. I'm at least going to, I'm going to well, let me show you a picture, right? And, and let me just tell you, let me tell you what, you know, how we're going to think about this. So we're going to think about this. Um, and, you know, we're going to look at, at inputs, right, in, into this production process. And as you point out, right, there, there's TFP, so I'll call that Z, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be labor, right? I'm going to call that L, right? And then, you know, we're going to sort of, if you will, you know, in our calculations later on, solve out for capital, right, which is we're going to think about as a function of, of, of Z and L. So this is going to be a growth accounting exercise. This entire paper is just doing some growth accounting, right? Some sectoral growth accounting. And what we're gonna take as, as given are long run trends in Z and long run trends in L. We're gonna look at those separately, right? And then we're gonna ask, gee, can we explain, if you will, you know, this long run change in this growth rate, right? Using, you know, long run changes in Z and L. So, so that's what we're gonna do. Now your point about, 
you know, female labor force participation and male labor force participation later on and aging of the labor market and changes in the quality of labor, et cetera, right? Education, et cetera. Those are all things, right, that are parts of L, right? And we're going to condition on those and look at them. Now, I'm not going to break that out. I'm not going to think about variations in L as coming from those different sources. So I'm not going to, we're not going to push the growth accounting to ask how much of it comes from, how much of the change in the growth rate of L comes from female labor force participation, how much of it comes from quality adjustments that come from education, et cetera, right? But we are going to examine, right, these trend growth rates in L, right? And I'll show you those. Some of them will look like female labor force participation, like, you know, here's this one, right? So here's, you know, aggregate labor growth, right? And, you know, this is what you're talking about, right? That's, you know, that's, a lot of that, yeah. right? Is, yep. Well, yep. it's the, you know, it's the baby boomers, right? And it's labor force participation, right? Um, a lot of this is the decline in male labor force participation, et cetera, right? Okay, so what we're gonna do, so, so you know, so here's, you know, here's this puzzle, puzzle, right? Fact, right? And, uh, you know, here's labor. And, you know, if you look down below here, my, my graphs, I should have been able to put them side by side, right? If I was good as a slide producer, which I'm not, right? But you can see, um, right, that, you know, as labor was doing this, you know, TFP was doing this, right? So, um, you know, can we explain, you know, via simple growth accounting, um, you know, um, again, solving out for capital, right? Can we explain, right, that um, with those two things, right? And, and the answer turns out to be we can explain some of it, right? But, um, you know, not a lot of it, or some of it, but, but not all of it. I, so here's, you know, here's, the, here's just the numbers again, right? Here, the number we looked at, that was average GDP growth over this period, the early part of the period, the late part of the period. So there was a change of about, um, you know, um, 232 basis points, I guess, in growth rates, right? You know, if you look at labor and TFP, right, their growth rates both declined, you know? And so a question is, do these guys somehow add up to that, right, uh, when you take the right weighted average, okay? And, you know, this is, you know, as Rafet mentioned, right, this is a uh, a, you know, an old question, right? So you can see the answer to this in, you know, many papers, right? And the answer is, you know, from looking at these aggregates, you know, you can get uh, some of it, right? But not all of it, right? So think about, I'm going to call um, the growth rate of GDP, instead of using Y in most of this, I'm going to use V, because we're going to think about GDP as value added. I'm going to have gross output and net output. Um, in a little bit. So let me use the symbol V um, uh, for, for uh, GDP here, right? And then, you know, what would come out of a standard, you know, one sector growth accounting, you know, framework, right? You would have the average growth rate of GDP is the average growth rate in labor, you know, plus the average growth rate of, TD, uh, of uh, a TFP, right? Uh, divided by, you know, labor share, right? Or one minus capital share. Can I, can I ask a rather dumb question? Um, yeah. That labor share is based on, uh, at least, you know, when I was looking at it, it was based on um, national income, not yeah. private value added. And if you take the government out of it, is the labor share still one third? Um. I don't know the answer to that. I used it in this calculation. I think it's about that, but I don't, I should know the answer to that. I should know the answer to that. I think it's about that, you know, although I would think the labor share in government is somewhat higher, right? So I think That's this- what would I would have thought too. I so I, I don't know whether it's materially important here, but- um, yeah. yeah, well, it won't be, late, later on, what I'm gonna do is I'll, we'll do some detailed calculations of, of this right, using subsectoral shares, right, which are calibrated appropriately um, um, and not by me. Um, anyway, so that's a good point. That's a good point, okay? So anyway, if you stick in this one third here, um, 
which would be my back pocket number. But Rafet raises an interesting question, right? What you get, you know, and you can see this done, you know, in these papers, of course, is, you know, this 3.2% number, you know, um, overall, you know, using this simple accounting, you get about 2.7. So you're about whatever 60 basis points short, right? And if you look at changes, right, you see you get about, I don't know, 195 basis points of the 230 or something, right? So you're, you're a little shy um, for explaining this. So what are we gonna do in this paper? What we're gonna do in this paper is to think about, um, is to think about uh, changes in labor uh, input and changes in TFP, um, not in the aggregate, right? But in different sectors, right? And what we're gonna do is ask, um, you know, in some sense, are all sectors created equally? Um, in, in two senses, in, in one sense, if you look at, you know, the changes in Z and the changes in L in the different sectors, do they look the same? Right, or are they quite different in some sectors than other sectors? So we'll look at, we'll do some statistical, you know, kind of accounting in which we we look at the sectoral differences. We'll look at changes in in growth rates in these different sectors and ask, you know, are there common pieces? Are there sector specific pieces? So we'll do some sort of factor analysis to sort of think about that, and then. Um, we'll ask whether these, you know, sectors are created equally for this purpose. Um, in another sense, right? Some of these sectors, you know, turn out to be uh, important um, in producing um, materials, raw materials um, that go into uh, production, right? In other sectors, right? And some of these sectors are very important in producing capital, right? Which is used in other sectors. So you might think, right, that those sectors that produce important inputs in other sectors, right, might have a, might be more important in some sense than others. So what we're going to do is we'll look at a, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, if you will, uh, in sector accounting, right, that um, include these, um, you know, input output relationships that have to do with, um, uh, you know, with materials. Um, um, and, and also uh, in production of capital. So that's going to change these kinds of calculations and, um, you know, and allow us to refine the accounting. Um, Before you go ahead, I, yeah. um, can I ask uh, some ignorant questions and also, and yeah. I don't know. I, I, okay, this, this first one, I'm not asking it to be nasty, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you showed me this calculation, you know, the 2.7, for example, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, I would have said, "Wow, oh, success! You're done." Um, you know, national income accounting, the noise in that series. Uh, I mean, measurement error in TFP, uh, you know, labor input too. All of those things um, is 2.7 the same as 3.3? To my eye, by all means, um, right? You know, in terms of the change, um, is about minus two the same as about minus two? Yeah. So um, I guess the question here is. If you are going to tell me um, a sectoral story, I'm very happy to hear that. But if you ask me, you know, how dissatisfied are you with this, that you think we need another story? Um, sure. You know, you, you had me here already. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, uh, that's a good, that's a, that's a good point, right? Um, you know, we're going to, you know, as it turns out, you know, we're going to get this number closer to that number and this number closer to that number. That's fine. But you're going to say, well, in some sense, out of these are close enough anyway, right? A question, you know, a question is, you know, um, what are these things? Yeah. Right? Where do they come from? Are they affecting all sectors of the economy? Do we want, you know, if we're trying to explain this, right? It's going to be interesting, you know, as we look at this, it's going to be interesting. It turns out a very important sector is construction, right? In the early part of the sample, right? It had big movements in TFP and it's going to have, since it's producing capital for these other sectors, it's going to be important. So, you know, the sectoral stuff is going to be important because it allows us, I think, to look deeper into this to figure out what the hell's going on. And this, okay. excuse my language, but in the same thing that's going on here. <laughs> but, right. So if I may say so, I think this is a way better um, motivation than yeah. getting the numbers closer. 
Okay, um, great. So you have a question I'd like to ask, um, and if you're going to get to this at some point anyway, uh, no need to answer now. But um, so you're doing this through, you know, capital uh, through labor and TFP, but yeah. capital, I mean, the accumulation rates are also changing, and it's not entirely clear that same labor, same TFP endogenously turns into the same kind of capital anyway. So two things there. I mean, uh, you know, maybe we do want to think of some way of doing um, perpetual inventory or whatever and think about capital too separately. Uh, and also perhaps there is some sense in which it's useful to think about um, the nature of capital is self-changing and therefore the depreciation rate changing. Because if your main capital used to be, uh, you know, buildings which depreciate extremely slowly way back when, and now they are computers and every other year you have to throw them out. Uh, it's a whole different understanding of, you know, what capital is and how fast it's depreciating. And that's going to be reflected here. Sure, sure. So we're going to have, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to have, um, we're going to use constant depreciation rates. They're going to be different by sector, right? Um, they're going to be different by sector and within each sector, they're going to be computed. I mean, I should know this CLIMS data better, but they're going to be different because there's a different mix of types of capital, right, in each of these sectors. Now, we're going to be using one number, right, from 1950 to 2018. So the, you know, we're going to be using an average, if you will, depreciation rate by sector, right, across that time period. And there's variation right across time within sectors that we're going to be missing. Um, I should know the answer to this, and I think I don't know the answer to this. Um, we did many of the calculations that we're doing here by calibrating. You'll see we're going to do a mixture of some estimation and some calibration. Um, um, we did um, some of the calib we did most of the calibration of the parameters using sort of uh, estimates at particular points of time because we happen to have data for certain things at particular points of time. Um, you know, making use tables, capital flow tables, etc. Right, and um, if we had that information at different dates. We did the calculations with calibrations at different dates. I don't know if we did a robustness check for depreciation for these different dates. Um, I believe we probably didn't. Um, and so, you know, that's still a concern. It's still a concern. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, let me show you if I can, right? Let's just get a sense, right? And looking across these different uh, sectors, right? What's been going on on average over these different sectors. And then I'm gonna show you some variation across time within sectors, right? So, you know, um, uh, these are the sectors we're gonna look at. When we started this, I should say we were looking at, um, you know, about 60 sectors. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, 60 sector data were uh, noisy enough that um, it was uh, complicated to make sense of them. And so we aggregated these into, um, you know, 16 sectors. And you can see, you know, the share and value added ranges from about 2% right up to about, you know, 13%. So durable goods is about, um, has a uh, value added share of about 13% you know, mining, I guess, is the smallest, right, a, a value added share of about 2%. Um, and you can see here that, you know, a labor growth, right, and a TFP growth, right, has been different on average, right, in these different sectors. Um, you know, one thing you might ask, right, is, is uh, you know, the crudest calculation you could do, right, would be something like ask, you know, maybe how much of this decline came from a, you know, share shift kind of thing, right? You move from, you know, um, you know, sectors that had on average high growth rates to sectors that had low growth rates, right? And early on in the paper, you know, it's easy kind of to dismiss that just by looking at, um, 
you know, uh, computing this thing, computing GDP using different shares, using, you know, chain weights, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that, that turns out not to be the issue. The issue seems to be more, you know, what's going on within each of these sectors um, over time. So, you know, the paper has some pictures, a whole bunch of pictures that I'm going to show you here, right? Um, just to give you a, a sense of this, um, you know, here's one of them. So here's, um, these are also growth rates. So these are gonna be annual growth rates. This is growth rates, I'll sort of blow this up. This is in labor input, right? And it's labor input in these CLIMS data. So it's, you know, labor input, you know, everything's weighted by, you know, type of worker and education, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is really trying to measure, um, you know, labor input, you can see, you know, some sort of simple things like, you know, early in the sample in 1950, right, labor input in agriculture was declining by about 7% a year, something like that, you know, by the end, it had stabilized, right, durable goods sector, you know, was uh, increasing by about 5% um, early on, right, it was decreasing in the US, right at the end of the sample, right, um, yeah, you, know, you can see the various sectors here. Um, TFP, right, has a similarly, you know, interesting variations across these different sectors, right? You know, here's PBS. This is a, a, a professional business services, right? You can see it was high here and low here. Now, you know, as Rafet mentioned, and as as I'm sure many of you know. Right, how much of this is measurement error, right? That could even be low frequency measurement error, and how much of it is real? You know, I don't know the answer to that. And um, um, we are going to take these data as given and do some calculations. Measurement error in these things, you know, is going to spill over, right, in this accounting framework, right, in the measurement error, right? Well, certainly in the aggregates, right, but also into the aggregate value added, right? So. Um, so that's going to, that's going to be there. And I guess the question is, when we get to the end of this, you know, I'll say we've explained some things that is, we've done some couch, some accounting kinds of calculations to decompose the trend variation in aggregate, um, uh, value added into components that come from this. And, and a question, you know, that we'll have to face is how much of that is measurement error and, and how much of it isn't right. You know, here's one that's going to be important, and the question is, is you know, what is it, right? So here's TFP um, in construction, right? You can see, you know, in um, you know the 1950s, it was around. I'm guessing here around four percent in the U.S., and then it became negative, right? And has been sort of slightly negative, you know, post well, what post about 1960, right? So this is going to be um, one component of what's going on. Here's some, you know, here's, there's some clues here for what might be going on. You know, look at TFP and durable goods, right? In 2000, it was around 8%, right? 2018, it was around 0%, right? So this might be part of the story for what's going on with um, aggregate GDP. So let me tell you, if I can, what the paper does with this sort of background um, the paper, I guess, does, I, I wrote these things out. So the paper, I did this last night. So the paper does four things, I guess, right? So here's what I did. Number one, um, it's going to take these raw growth rates, right? Um, right, these wiggles uh, and turn them into these smooth curves, right? So we're going to think about those as the growth rate. So what, what, what's our model going to be about? It's not going to be about the black stuff that's moving up and down. It's about these, right, blue, if you will, moving averages. So I have to tell you how we did that, okay? Um, now, okay. Um, so then when you do that, right, the question is, we're then going to build a statistical model and we're going to break these growth rates into some common components. So these are factors, if you will, right? So there's going to be a, a, a common factor, aggregate factor, if you will, that's pushing around labor and TFP. These things might be correlated with one another, 
right? And then there's going to be sector specific stuff. So this is going to be the usual sort of decomposition and into you know common and, and idiosyncratic or sector specific stuff. But the, there's a question about sort of how you do this here and uh, sort of the right statistical framework to think about, right? We're thinking about sort of long run growth here, right? So the question is quite crudely, right? If you look at, if I just look at this data, right? There's something like, I guess, 69 annual observations, right? In these black growth rates, right? But how many observations are there really in this blue thing? Right, we've smoothed these out, right? So these, this blue thing is highly serially correlated, right? How do we think about doing, you know, the econometrics or the statistics right when effectively we have a very small sample, right? Because we have, you know, whatever, something like 70 years worth of data, but we've smoothed the heck out of it, right? So how are we gonna do that? So, you know, I'll talk about that. Um, and then what, um, so we got those two things, and then I'm going to, you know, um, write down a model, or my co-authors, I should say, are going to write down a model, which is sort of just a multi-sector. It's sort of the simplest, I think, multi-sector model that you can write down, where that's realistic enough to do some growth accounting. Um, so we're going to have these sectors interacting, and you know, some of the sec uh, sectors are going to be producing output. Um, output can be used for uh, uh, eating consumption. It can be used as inputs and material inputs uh, into other sectors production. And it can be used as investment to produce capital goods right in these other sectors. So, right, so we're gonna allow these uh, 16 sectors to interact um, in this general way, but in, you know, using a very sort of simple model. And uh, what so that, that is gonna do is, um, we're going to uh, condition then on um, sectoral um, labor input and TFP input, figure out once you account for all of these interactions, what do these things say about value added sector by sector, right? Then we can wait, take a weighted average of these sectoral um, uh, value added and get, you know, aggregate value added. This would be private GDP, right? And then we can ask, Right at the end of the day here, you know, once I've done this, I'm going to cheat here a little bit. This is going to be a balanced growth model. Notice, and we're just going to compute these growth rates, right? Notice I didn't put any time subscripts on these. Okay. Well, then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go back here to number two, and we're going to say, well, wait a minute, up here, right, we put time subscripts on these growth rates. So we're gonna take our time subscripted growth rates, feed them in to this balanced growth relationship, right? And um, ask, you know, how common factors um, affecting all of these different sectors and sector specific factors, right? Change this aggregate growth rate in GDP, right? So this is what we're gonna put things together. Okay, so that's it, so that's all we do. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk you through those four things, right? And then that'll be that. And may I ask a question? Yes. So do you um, scale the model variables in bullet point three so that it's stationary? Um, because this growth model, so I just don't know how you solve this and keep things stationary while having um, balance yeah. growth rate moving around. So it's very yeah. difficult. So we're going to think about, uh, no, so I, I should I should be clear. So we're going to think about, I mean, when we work it out, we're going to have balanced growth and balanced growth is going to be, uh, is going to be with fixed things, right? And then we're going to ask, you know, it's the equivalent of, you know, what happens if I changed, right, the um, growth rate of, you know, TFP, right, in one of these sectors, right? So, so that's see. what we're doing. I see, so you're essentially changing one thing at a time and looking at the balance growth implications. Exactly, and then we're gonna feed all of those in. Now I should say, I should say, you know, those results turn out to be the same as, right? Um, take this balance, take, take this model that I'm gonna look at, right? And, um, add some components in which the 
Um, growth rates don't change permanently, but they change, you know, using, you know, autoregressive processes with AR coefficients of 0.9999999, right? So, and then work out the, you know, impulse responses. Those, those turn out to be the same, right? As what we're doing. Medically, here. they should be same in there. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, so there's two ways of thinking about what we're doing it, okay. right? The first of which you asked, I think is, is an important question. And that's the way I think about this. You know, we're going to think about these things, right? These things are down here. I guess when I have time subscripts changing so slowly, right? That capital has had an opportunity to adjust appropriately. It's going to be like a super low variance, but really persistent shift. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, so you know uh, um, we're not the first people to think about any of this. There is a vast literature on this, and there is a vast literature on this. If I had had more time last night, I would have listed all of the papers you know um, that are here and here, right? But you guys can look at the references to the paper and see that there are a zillion papers here, and um, you know papers here. Now we're going to follow. Um, when we think about low frequency trends, we're going to follow um, a particular framework that, um, you know, Ulrich Mueller and I have um, found useful for um, several papers over the last decade or so. So you'll see we're going to use, we'll be using sort of this approach there. You can see that um, we have a recent um, a handbook of econometrics paper, which is, uh, um, as yet um, unpublished, um, but you can, um, um, all of this stuff is discussed in detail um, in this paper in a, in a survey-like way. So in, in a, you know, hopefully reasonably accessible way. You can see the paper per se for, you know, all of the important work that's been done on multi-sector models. Most of this work or most of the recent work on multi-sector models has been thinking not, has been thinking about, not about growth, right, but thinking about cyclical variability. You know, if I think about cyclical variability in aggregate GDP, how much of it comes from cyclical variability in these different sectors and how does that interact, et cetera. So there's been a, you know, a, a large uh, and important recent literature on that, um, less on growth, I think, um, it's fair to say. So, so that's kind of our little niche here in this. Okay. So let me start, you know, going back to what, you know, I wanted to do here, right? What did I want to do? I wanted to do these four things. I'll keep reminding myself as I go through the slides what I'm doing. So let's start here, right? How am I going to get, you know, these smooth growth rates um, from the raw data? And let me just show you a picture that I think makes this clear. Okay, so what do I, what's my goal? My goal is to take, you know, growth rates in labor and growth rates in TFP um, and turn those, so these are the raw data, right? Turn those into smooth, you know, local growth rates, right? Which I did in some of the pictures that we looked at by looking at 11 year centered moving averages, right? So what I'm gonna do is make that 11 year centered moving average thing I'm going to use sort of a slightly different method. And the reason I'm going to use a slightly different method is because later on, I need to think about, in some sense, how many observations do I have when I'm doing the um, empirical work, when I've got, you know, these long run phenomenon and um, how can I break these, these long run trends into some, you know, roughly uncorrelated pieces and how do I think about doing the analysis, right? So here's the, the framework that um, you know, Ulrich and I have been using, and it's related to you know, other methods that people have used um, for a while. So generically, let's just suppose um, you know, I have some raw data, you know, the growth rate on some variable X, here it is for GDP. So this was, uh, this was our cyclically adjusted um, you know, GDP data, right? And I looked at 11 year moving averages of that, right? In the, in the first picture, okay? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take these data, okay? And then I'm gonna specify a set of regressors, right? Um, over this period, and these regressors are gonna look, you know, the first regressor is gonna be constant. The second regressor 
you know, is going to have a period of one half, right? These are all going to be really smooth. They're going to be cosine terms of, of different um, periodicities, right? This guy has period one over the sample. This guy has period whatever, one and a half, two, et cetera, right? I think I have a constant term in eight of these regressors, okay? And then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take this guy and regress it on those nine variables, okay? If I take this guy and regress it on nine, those nine variables, these are the regression coefficients. I didn't show you the constant term, right? But each of these dots right here, right, this, is the OLS regression coefficient from regressing this guy onto this guy, right? This is the OLS regression coefficient from regressing this guy into this guy, et cetera, right? So here are some estimated regression coefficients, right? I, 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 so I'm gonna ask a question that is surely yeah. going to embarrass me and perhaps be summoned back to your time series class, but um, why am I not looking at the spectral density of this and looking at the densities and rather than that, doing this with a regression? Yeah, so, um, okay, so uh, another way of, of you know, um, um, so Rafet's comment is this. Um, one thing I could do, so let's take this series uh, delta xt, right? One thing I could do is take this thing and, you know, pass it through a filter, I'll call it C of L, right? Form this moving average. I showed you centered 11 month moving averages. That would be an example of that, right? And Rafet's comment is this, right? G, if I chose this C of L, right? So that what it, well, it passed low frequencies and sort of zeroed out high frequencies, right? Then this thing, right, would be an estimate of, you know, the trend, the low frequency variability, right, in delta X. That's what we're doing here. That's essentially what we're doing here, okay? It turns out that this is one way to do this sort of, you know, um, low pass filtering here. Um, uh, I'll show you uh, exactly you know, what that inner, what that point is right there in just a second. The advantage of this is that um, these dots of which there are eight here, right? Turn out to have some nice statistical properties. They are not very correlated with one another, right? So if I'm now gonna take this thing, this low pass thing and do some econometric analysis with it, this is gonna be highly serially correlated. This allows me to characterize that serial correlation in a very simple way so that I can do the, I can do further econometric analysis with it, okay? But the key thing, right, and this is, this is an important point, is that, you know, this, what we're doing here is one way, right, to approximate that ideal low pass filter. Okay. May I ask a follow-up question? Yes. I was going to actually, ask about the low pass filter, but you already talked yep. about this. But so the way I, I'm, I'm understanding this is, so you can do spectral representation of a covariance yes. stationary process. Yes, yes. And you're going to isolate out only a lower frequency coefficient. Yes, exactly. It's estimate only on lower frequency guys, so you can forget about the high frequency guys. Exactly. So this is gonna, so this is very much, I mean, what we've, what I've written here, is we've used these cosine terms, right? If we were doing sort of Fourier stuff instead of just, these are cosine transforms instead of Fourier transforms. If, I mean, this is just for, for those of you that are nerdy here, right? If we'd use sines and cosines here, they would have been, this would be just, these would be Fourier coefficients, right? We've used these cosine things um, for really no good reason. It turns out to give some, it's gonna yield some covariance matrices that are easy to interpret in some special cases, right? But we could have used Fourier coefficients as well. So, so it's like high frequency guys would be orthogonal anyway. They will be in the residual. Because yes. low frequency guys, the fitted values will be meaningful. This is what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. So let me just show you here, if I can come back, right? Let me just show you the fitted value from regressing this guy on this guy, 
is shown as this solid blue curve here. So this is the picture, right? That's what we're gonna be using. Now, what is this, right? Importantly, right? If you think about this curve right here, right? This is a highly serially correlated curve. Cool. Where does it come from? It's the fitted values of this thing onto this guy. This is deterministic, right? These are just cosine things, right? So the serial correlation or the randomness in this that I wanna think about when I'm doing my statistics, right? Where, where is that? Well, that comes from the regression coefficients. So I can think about the statistical properties of this right, by thinking about the statistical properties of those eight, do eight dots, right? And that's what's gonna make the statistic, that's what makes the statistical analysis, right, um, uh, easy to do, right? Let me make that a little clearer with a few, I mean, maybe it's clearer, maybe it's less clear, right, with a few, um, you know, equations, right? So here, I'm just gonna explain the regression, right? So the regression, here's the data, I'm gonna regress on a constant, that's gonna give me the sample mean. I'm gonna regress on some regressors. Here are those cosine terms, right? So that's these guys right here, these red things, right? And then there's gonna be some regression coefficients, right? Corresponding to each of these cosine terms, that's this X thing, those are those dots, right? So there are, what? There were eight of them here, right? So I guess I've written it here as there are Q of them. Q is equal to eight in our example. And going back to Rafet's comments, the fitted value from this, right? Which is this, turns out to be basically an ideal, very close to an ideal low pass filter, right? corresponding to periods that are greater than, well, 2t over q, if you do the arithmetic. Here, q is eight. We have 69 years worth of data. So I'm looking at periods greater than 17 years, okay? In this picture here, I also showed you what, what you would get if you just, ran this regression on the first six of these. So those would then be periods greater than what, two T over six. So it's about 25 years, right? And what do you get? Well, you get something that's a little smoother. So what you are showing us here as the trends aren't the fit of one of them. It's the fit of all of them, right? It's the fit of all of them. That's correct. Okay. okay. Right. Right, so it's exactly, so I've taken this guy, regressed it on the, on all of these guys, yeah. right? Okay. That's the fit. And so then, the first time you were, the first time you were explaining this, I thought you, when you said this guy, I thought you were pointing to one of those. Okay, no, no, and no. And I was trying to understand how is it not just a simple scaling of it? Now exactly. it's, okay. so it's Very putting good. all of these together, okay. right? Now you okay. can see, right, if I, you know, I'll do this here, right? If I got rid of these two bottom guys, that's gonna take out some of the wiggles, yeah. right? And by taking out some of the wiggles, I'm gonna get this guy, it's less wiggly, right? It, this is gonna have, you know, periods greater than about 25 years. So when we do this analysis in this paper, right? We, we're gonna use Q is equal to eight. So I'm gonna look at periods greater than about 17 years. If I think about growth, right? If I think about growth, I'm thinking about the economy has had a, over 17 years. That's kind of the long run that I'm thinking about. The capital stock has adjusted, right? You might say that's not long enough. Maybe I should be looking at a 25 year period or a 30 year period, and that's gonna knock out, right? Those things, my sample size is gonna be smaller. I'm not gonna, you know, here my sample size is small enough. I've got a sample size of eight. I've got sort of eight, data points here, right? Characterizing this long run. If I get rid of these, I'm going to have like six. Uh, I'm question. Asked a, yeah. a question. So, I mean, when I first saw the introductory figures, yeah. what I thought about is things like um, secular stagnation, like changes yeah. in trends. And so yeah. those things are not exactly long-term things, but medium frequency things, right? 
Well, so we're not going to, so, I mean, the, so the quite, I mean, I mean, your question is, gee, you know, um, can, I think your question is, can I capture that here? Right. And uh, what I'm capturing here is I'm capturing it with, you know, periods greater than 17 years. So that's, you know, no, 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 I, I, I was just wondering what if you use something like band pass filter and um, isolate certain frequencies and let's say what happens in certain different ranges. Yeah, okay, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. What I know is this, right? Here I'm looking at, you know, low pass. I, I'm looking at a band, the equivalent of band pass. I would get something very similar if I was looking at a band pass where I was looking at um, uh, periods longer than 17 years. Now your point is, gee, what if I looked at 17 to, you know, to 10 or something, right? What if I looked in this range, right? And I don't know the answer to that. Because I was wondering, I think um, a lot of adjustments happen over, say, two decades. And so you know, it's so interesting to see different ranges. That's what I was asking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what we're going to do is this. We're going to we're going to use this, which is periods longer than seventeen years, and then I'll show you some stuff, as I recall, in which I look at periods longer than twenty five. And I think if you look in the paper, maybe I do periods longer than about 15 or, 10, or, you know, I take this, I suspect what I did, if I remember this right, is in my benchmark model, I use all eight of these mm -hmm. and then I cut two out yes. and then I add two more, right? So, so yeah, I, that was what I was asking because you yeah. don't need to use all of, the all of the coefficients, right? You can use yes. only some of them and it'll give yes, you- Yes, exactly, values. exactly. And you'll see that the results are, are roughly the same, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, if I'm cutting out those observations, you know, I've cut out 25% of my sample, right? And so things are going to be, you know, somewhat are going to be less precise. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, here's the uh, advantage of doing it this way as opposed to just doing bandpass stuff and all of that, right? It turns out that these regression coefficients, these dots, right, turn out, right, to have, you know, a very nice property. Um, they turn out to be, you know, approximately normally distributed, right? Well, because what, what are their averages of these data, right? So it's not too surprising that there's some central limit theorem or something, right, that tells you that they're going to be normally distributed. What's sort of interesting is that the central limit theorem is going to hold if the data, if the underlying X data are I zero covariate stationary, right? Or if they're very, even if they're uh, not I zero, if they're quite persistent, even if they're I one, or even if there's some mix of I zero and I one, right? Going back to this data, right? What are we trying to explain, right? We're trying to explain something that looks, you know, like a mean that's sort of changing. This doesn't look, I don't want to use I zero kind of stuff to think about this. I want to use something that's much more persistent, right? So I better have an econometric method that's going to work, right? If I'm using um, persistent data. So this central limit theorem, right? Is going to hold under a wide range of persistence patterns, right? For the underlying data, right? That I'm looking at. It, it turns out that you can characterize this um, um, long run, this variance um, of these um, things as a function of sort of two features of the data. One is a scale sigma squared. If the data are more volatile, right? Then when I run a regression, they're gonna be more volatile. Um, but also, you know, the shape of the spectrum right around frequency zero. If the spectrum is more steep, right around frequency zero, that means the data are more persistent, right? And that's gonna be reflected in a higher variance of this omega thing, a higher variance, particularly, right? For thinking about the regression coefficients on these very, right, long run things. So you can see here, it looks like, you know, that first regression coefficient, right, is bigger in some sense, right? Than some of these others kind of has a bigger variance, right? it's capturing that, right? So that's gonna be reflected, right, in this omega matrix. In this particular paper, in, in work I've done with Ulrich, 
we've used this to do a variety of things, right? In this particular paper, it's useful because I can think about X as having a kind of an I zero component with a constant mean and then a slowly varying mean, right? Which I might model as an I one process, right? And then there's a parameter governing, you know, the relative importance of these two things. That's a parameter gamma, right? So I can characterize this omega matrix by a scale, right? And by a, a parameter that governs which of these is relatively more important. Okay, so that's going to be the... So, so yeah, I, I, my guess is that you can write this thing as something that looks like a local level model. Exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is, this is going to be a, lo this is a local level yeah, model. Yeah, that's what I was and, thinking. Yeah. And this would be, you know, this parameter here, you know, sometimes you write this local level model and there's a parameter, you know, G over T on the, on the Martingale component. This parameter gamma is G. Okay. I, I, I think now I actually really understand what's going on. Thank you. Um, okay. So that's that. Okay. So what have I done? Uh, this is a great seminar because I'm one hour into it and I've done number one. Okay, so that's great. Okay, that means that there have been good questions and um, fun things to talk about. So let me do this. I'll do this a little bit. Well, anyway, I'll just do this, right? And then let's see um, where we get. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is uh, so, what are the data that I'm dealing with now? I've taken going to go back up here. I've taken, for example, all of my sectoral data, all of the black wiggles. I've smoothed the heck out of it. Okay. The data I'm going to use in my analysis are no longer the black things that are jumping around. They're these smooth blue things. These sm smooth blue things, right, are just functions of these regression coefficients, these dots, these Xs. Okay. So, you know, to make that clear, right? So I guess I should have done this. I should have, uh, you know, done this with my uh, color, right? The smooth blue things are these. I Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm calling these, these G things, right? So that's this, right? And what am I gonna do now? I'm gonna sort of think about a factor model, right? for the smooth growth rate of labor and TFP sector by sector. So this is I runs from one to 16. I've got 16 sectors here, right? And what are, what are we going to think about the variation in here? Well, if you stared at those pictures a little bit, right, you would say, gee, for some of these things, you know, think about, you know, Rafet's comment early on, right? Labor's, labor went up in the 1960s, right? Because of female labor first participation, et cetera, right? It declined, right, in, in the 95, 2000s as, as everyone aged. That's gonna affect all sectors in some sense, right? So there's gonna be some common factors affecting that. There might be some, you know, TFP improvements that are not sector specific that could in principle be affecting all sectors, right? So let's have some factors that capture that, right? And then let's have, you know, some sector specific unique factors, right? So this would be sort of a standard, you know, factor model for those growth rates, okay? Now remember each of these growth rates is a function of those deterministic cosine things, right? And then the random part, right? Which were these X's, right? These dots, right? So as it turns out this, um, since this is a nice linear function, right, um, implies a factor structure, right, on these uh, regression coefficients, right? So these are the dots that I showed you, right? The regression coefficients, there are going to be some regression coefficients corresponding to these factors, right? And some regression coefficients corresponding to these sector specific things. And those things, when added up, are gonna give rise to the regression coefficients right on the raw data. Now, I have a probability structure for thinking about, you know, the probability of those random variables. I'm gonna use that, right, treating these as data, right, to estimate the parameters, right, of this model, right? Once I have the estimated parameters, right, I can go back, right, and decompose these growth rates. 
Right. So, so that's what we're going to do here. Can I ask a, quickly ask the following? Yeah. Um, so these are factors, but they are not, you know, latent factors. The way we think of latent factors, you've estimated them. You know the factors already, right? Um, no, in, this in, is no, 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 no. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, 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 yes, uh, in in the following sense, um, I know the aggregate. I, I know what the uh, these trends are in the aggregate data. I know what they are in each one of these sectors, and I know the sector weights that have to add up to that aggregate data, right? So, I mean, I, I can see how I can think of this as factors, right? But is, is there another way to think of this where it's yeah. a yeah. Yeah. Great, great, cleaner great. decomposition, so to speak? Yep, yep, okay. So so here's the, here, here's the way we're, I'm gonna think about these factors, okay? So these, these are these sectoral things, mm -hmm. okay? So these are the sectoral things, okay? I'm now gonna do a factor analysis for these things. And what are these, these are gonna be latent, these F things that I've written down here are gonna be latent factors. Mm -hmm. They're things that are explaining the co-variability of these Xs across sectors. But somewhere, I guess somewhere I'm separately sorry. is my understanding that uh, whichever way I do this, they also have to add up to the aggregate data that I have, right? Okay, and so that, gonna... that restriction seems to be a um, informative restriction to impose on the system somewhere. So these are not the factor. These are not um, the aggregate labor and aggregate TFP yeah. and hence like aggregate value added later, right? Is going to be a linear function of these things. And that means it's gonna be a linear function of these things plus these things. Now your yeah. question is, well, wait a minute, shouldn't these all average out, right? And the answer is gonna be no, not really, right? I'll show you some results in which, you know, these guys are going to be uncorrelated with one another. So they're going to sort of average out. But you have to remember, there are only 16 sectors here, right? So it's statistically, right? There's not going to be a law of large numbers that says 16 is big enough so that, you know, these guys are going to average out completely. Okay. I, so you I, don't want to... Can I, can I, I rephrase think... the question? Um, if the sector shares were not changing... Yes. The, the latent factors that explain the greatest variance in the among the sectors, okay, would be the factors that also explain the greatest share of the variance of the aggregate yes. um, smooth okay. curve that you have. But yes. the way we are doing it now, that that requirement is not imposed, right? I'm just trying to explain, you know, get those factors that explain most of the sectors. Yes. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna be estimating this by principal components, right? Okay. You're, you're you're saying, G Mark, why don't you do this by principal components? You know, I think actually the results would be pretty similar if I did this. If I did it by principal components, just because 16 is pretty big, but these really are. The, I want to think about these as co-movement factors, not aggregate factors. Okay. If that helps. Okay. Maybe shut up for a while and you know let you talk about what it is that you are doing. Then I'll ask if I am still okay. not okay. clear. Great, okay. great, great. Okay. So so anyway, so I'm going to go estimate this thing, right? These are you know, and um, you have to be you know remember here that you know each of these things, right? These are eight dots, right? Each of these is eight by one. So this is a small sample problem, right? This is not. Right, I, I don't, I'm not going to do asymptotic analysis in some sense. I'm, you know, right. There's going to be lots of sampling uncertainty, right? When I get finished with this, right? Because I'm doing long run analysis. I'm talking about growth rates, right? Where I've got 70 years worth of data, right? And I'm looking at at like periods longer than like 20 years. Okay, so there are a few, you know, there aren't a lot of observations, right, per series, right, on this long run thing. Okay, so this is so you really want to think about this right as a small sample statistical problem right it turns out you know this little result that I had up here wherever it was right 
this little result here turns out to be very useful because even though it's a small sample problem, that is there aren't very many X's, these X's are normally distributed because of the averaging, large sample averaging over T. So I can do sort of small sample Gaussian factor analysis in, 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 the, in the sense. Okay, so how are we gonna estimate this? You can, we're gonna estimate this, um, you know, using Bayes methods, um, usually, whether you estimate something using Bayes methods or using frequentist methods, if you've got a large sample, doesn't matter because, you know, the likelihood, but like the data are going to swamp the prior and, um, you know, uh, so the prior is not going to be particularly important. This is an example because the sample size is small, right, that priors are going to matter. They're still going to be there, right, um, even after we've done this. So if you look at the paper, you see, you know, we discuss these priors in a bit more detail than one might typically uh, do for this reason, right? Um, and we also show some results as we change the priors so you can get some sort of sense of, you know, how important they are, right? Um, okay. Uh, Rafet, going back to your comment, one of the priors that we're going to impose is this. If you look at the share weighted averages of these factor loadings, the share weighted averages are going to be one, right? That means if I look at aggregates, the aggregate labor is going to load with a coefficient of one, right, on FL. So FL is going to be, you know, feed into aggregate labor one yeah. for one. Yeah. But you know, the shear weighted average of this might not be necessarily zero because there are only 16 sectors. Okay. Okay. So let me show you the results. You can just sort of see that I'm going to make this picture a little smaller here, but I, there's a couple of things, right, that are worth looking at this when you do it. Let's look at um, um, here are these different sectors. So I'm just going to show you uh, a few of them, right? Let's look at durable goods, right? Here's the factor loading on labor, factor loading on TFP. It turns out for durable goods, the common factor in labor explains 33% of the variation in labor and durable goods. So the common factor is important there. For TFP, the common factor explains very little. So most of the variation in TFP and durable goods doesn't come from common sources. Apparently it comes from, right, whatever the heck's going on in this sector. Um, these, uh, okay, if you look across all of these, so if you look at these R squareds here, you see the R squareds for labor are, for this common factor are, you know, uh, average numbers of around 0.2 or something. These things for TFP are all pretty small. So they're not explaining very much, you know, 2%, 3%, 4%, et cetera. If you then take these things and average them, right? And you get the aggregates. Well, I said we impose the restriction that the ab sector weighted average factor loading is one. So that shows up here, right? The common factor in labor explains about two thirds of the variation in aggregate labor. The common factor in TFP explains about 30% of the variation in aggregate TFP. Okay, so let me just show you a picture here. I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna skip this. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to this, okay. So here, let's go back. These are now aggregates. This is aggregate labor. We looked at this early on. This is aggregate TFP. We looked at this early on. Here's the trend in aggregate labor. So that's just the fitted value from that regression. I've repeated it right here. So that blue curve here is the same and it's the same right here. And now you can ask, gee, how much of this blue curve, that's the data, right, is explained by this common factor? That's this red thing. 
So you can see for labor, right, this common factor explains a lot of that, right? This is, and, and probably for good reason, right? This is, you know, female labor force participation, et cetera, right? It's doing, you know, what you might think of, you know, here's some sector specific stuff. It's kind of just wiggling around, right? For TFP, you kind of get the opposite, right? This common thing isn't doing very much at all, right? Rather, it's that, gee, these different sectors have unique things going on with them, right? You take a weighted average of them and they explain, right, most of that movement, okay? So what have we done now? We've done a sort of statistical decomposition, right, of sectoral growth in labor and TFP, right? Now I wanna put that together and get aggregate value added back, right? But I'm not just gonna take these aggregates and put those together, right? What I'm gonna do is take all of the sectors and put them together, right? And for that, I need a model of all of the interactions, right? So I can do the accounting right, okay? So that's what this is, okay? So the model is- So, okay, I, I'm very dumb, but why do I need the interactions? Because I treated these as independent sectors when extracting these factors, no? Um, and- But now you know, I care about I just... But now so I care yeah. about, so, so, so for this, right, I don't need anything. Now, if I care about, aggregate value added, not aggregate labor, aggregate value added, if there's something that you, is unique that goes on in durable goods, but durable goods produces material and capital that goes into the non-durable goods sector, right? That's gonna affect non-durable goods output, right? And I guess via capital, non-durable goods value added, right? So I need, if I'm thinking about value added, I got to think about how, you know, the, these um, sector specific labor and TFP inputs are affecting not what's going on only in their sector, but through materials and capital, what's going on in other sectors. Okay, so this is where I would have found a simple dumb model useful because it feels like taking what you've done earlier as correct, all those interactions should have shown up in the TFP for each sector already. Okay, well, we'll see. Okay, okay. So let, let, me show you, let me show you two dumb models and then let me show you three dumb models, right? <laughs> and only be, one, but okay, it'll very be, good. It'll be dumbest, dumber, and dumb or something, right? I'll go in that direction. Okay. Okay. So, so here, okay. So let's start right with a one sector model, right? And in a one sector model, what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get, here's value added. That's output, right? Depends on Z and it depends on L. Z and L, I'm going to condition on those. So let me just go Z times L to the one minus alpha. Let me just call that A. Okay. And then I got it, and then I got K to the alpha, okay? So now if I think about, you know, what's, um, what's growth rate and value added gonna be here, right? What's well, gonna be growth rate in A, right? Um, you know, times, you know, one over one minus alpha, right? So that's the little growth accounting thing that we did before, right? Now let me take a two sector model. Okay, so I'm going to write down a two sector model. And this is like, you know, this is like this Greenwood Herkowitz Crusell model, right? It, it, in a very simple form of it, right? Very simple form of it, right? And it's going to look like this, right? So let's suppose I have one sector and it produces a consumption good. Okay, and it's got its own A, right? Which is going to be labor and Z in that sector. And then I've got another sector, right? that produces an investment good, okay? And this investment good is used to produce the capital stock and the capital stock is used, right? Uh, the capital stock gets broken up. Some of it's used here, some of it's used here, right? If you do the growth accounting here, right? Well, what do you get, right? It turns out, you know, um, here's 
aggregate value added, that's a share weighted of that of the growth rate in sector one and in sector two, right? What's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna be the shear weighted growth rate in A in sector one plus the shear weighted growth rate in sector two, but sector two gets this extra bang, right? Because it's, it's responsible for capital, right? Just as this sector was responsible up here, right? So sector one and sector two, these aren't created equal, right? The one that's producing capital, right, is more valuable in this sense, right, leads to a higher growth rate. Okay. Now you can take this model, right, and put more sectors in it, right? And that's, this was, if this was dumbest and this is dumber, right? This is gonna be model three, right, which is dumb, right? It's gonna be the same model, but it's gonna have more interactions and it's gonna have more notation, right? I got it, it's, it's also useful, I think, to write it down because I can tell you sort of how we calibrated the variety, variety of parameters, okay? So this is gonna be an in-sector model, right? Um, each sector is gonna produce some output, okay? The output in sector J, is going to be is going to be a function of inputs into that sector, right? Um, times value added, right? So V is going to be value added in that sector. Okay, the um, output in sector Y. I'm going to jump down here to the bottom. The output in sector Y can be used for three things. It can be used for consumption which is valued by this. It can be used for materials in other sectors, right? And it can be used for investment goods, right? And investment goods give rise, I should work through this systematically, but I'm not. Investment goods for in sector J, right? Um, uh, can be, where do I have this? Investment goods in sector J can be used to produce an aggregate investment good, right, for the other sectors, right, which then lead to their sector specific capital, right? So let me just try to be a little bit more systematic here, right? I've got in different goods, consumption goods, those are valued, right? This is a simple model. So all these elasticities are good. I'm going to have unit elasticities every place, right? Um, uh, here's the production function for each of these different sectors. Each sector uses a material aggregate, right? Which comes from materials from all of the other sectors. Um, its value added is some TFP and labor input. These are gonna be our A's that we looked at. This is what we looked at right in the statistical model. It's also gonna depend on capital. Capital, right, comes from investment in that sector's capital. Investment in that sector's capital is an aggregate, right, of investment goods produced, right, um, as components of, of the output in all of the other sectors, okay? So you've got a variety of elasticities here right? Um, how does sector I's output of capital goods feed into investment in sector J? There's going to be a coefficient, right? Omega IJ that comes from that, right? If you've got perfect competition in, you know, labor markets, these are all shares, right? So you can read these off the capital flow table. Um, you can read the materials things off the input output tables, the make use tables. You can read this theta on expenditure shares and final goods for all of these things. So you can calibrate, right, all of these different parameters, right? And if you do that, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I see my, as I prepared these slides, I was going through this one at a time and showing you each of these, but, um, I'll say they're kind of boring, they're not. My co-authors don't think they're boring at all, but anyway, they're they are this, right? What do you get when you get at 
to the end of the game here, right? What do you get? Well, now I can compute the growth rate for all of these N sectors, N is equal to 16, as a function of these inputs, right, in all of the other sectors, right? So these A's are what? This is, you know, A, remember A, right, is labor plus TFP, right, where these are weighted appropriately. You know, that's got a, um, oops, this has a one minus alpha inverse in it, right, which is gonna be sector specific. Okay. okay, so quite quickly ask a question. Now I can ask my question properly, I guess. Yeah. Um, so this is exactly the kind of model that I needed and thank you for it. Yep. And if you started with the model, I would have looked at this and said, okay, so if I knew the true sector level TFP growth rates, yes. right? This is yeah. how these would be aggregated up. Correct. Yes, exactly, exactly. Right? Exactly. Now, but if this is the system, is your way of identifying the... TF, measuring TFP and getting the factors off of it based on this system, still correct, right? Because there are all kinds of dependencies here. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it may well be, it's just not obvious to me that yeah. if you started okay. me off of with this model, um, right, taking this data yeah. and, you know, calculating my TFP as usual and running a factor model on it yeah. would be okay. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so this is what, this is what the model gives me. The model gives me this. You give me TFP and labor for each sector. Yeah. This produces, and I should say blop, right? This produces value added in each sector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what this is. Yeah. Okay? I could then take those, weight those by shares, and get aggregate value added. Okay. Right. These yeah. are exogenous variables in this model. Right. So what am uh, I, what did I do? Right. What's the exercise here? Let me model these exogenous variables. That's what my statistics did. Factor model, right or wrong, or whatever the hell it is, right? But it's a model for this exogenous process. Now this model tells me how that maps into the endogenous variables, you know, which are capital, uh, you know, in all these different sectors, consumption in all the different sectors, right? In particular, value added in all the different sectors, right? And I guess my fear uh, here is that um, your, your, your sector weights, for example, are actually time varying um, in, in a sense that, you know, they will be if some sectors permanently have faster TFP growth versus others. Right, sure. sector weights are going to change, exactly. right? Um, exactly. And if I'm not factoring this in, then what I measure as TFP isn't really TFP, and therefore, right, um, it, it really is TFP convoluted with changes in factor shares, which I'm not properly, or sector sure. shares, which I'm not properly accounting for, right? Sure. So that's that, that's you know, really I the question that I'm asking now. So, yep. so that the, the point here is, is, is you're absolutely right. As I go from here to here, you know, this, this requires, right, these things aren't changing. You can do these calculations as we've done here, right? For a variety of different choices yep. of these. You can use full sample averages. You can use the first 10 years. You can use the last 10 years. You can chain weight. You can do this or that, right? And you get small changes, right? But the big conclusions, right? The substantive conclusions don't vary much. So as long as I put here and these are slowly veering, the empirical conclu conclusions don't change very much, which is different than saying logically, is there a difference, right? Yes, there is. So good to know. Okay. So I'm going to just sort of jump ahead here, right? Because I have about f three minutes left and I want to make sure I get to the important things, right? You can see here what's going to be important, though, if you look at, you know, some of this. What's going to be important, as it turns out, right, are sectors, right, that, um, uh, that are important, provide important inputs into other, into other sectors, right? This is for materials, right? And in particular, it turns out capital, right, is, is important for this, right? 
And what are, so this is the capital flow table for the United States uh, uh, in 1995 or something like this, right? It shows, you know, uh, what fraction of, agri of agriculture's uh, capital, if you will, comes from durable goods, right? And you can see if you look across this row for durable goods, right, not surprisingly, all of these numbers are big, because durable goods produce capital goods, right? Which feed into everything, right? Uh, Non-durable goods are less important, right? Uh, construction turns out to be an important sector as well, not surprisingly, because, you know, the output of construction, right, are, is durable and that it feeds into capital, right, and other things. So what can you do here, right? When I, and here's kind of the, interesting bottom line here. If I look at aggregate value added, so this is value added, this is the first picture, this is GDP, the growth rate of GDP, right? It's what? It's the growth rate in value added in each of these sectors times the sector shares, right? Here's the vector of A's, if you will, labor input and TFP for all of these different sectors. These are the multipliers, right? Notice that, of course, they all get multiplied by their share, right? That's the immediate effect. But this, this is all the interaction stuff, right? This interaction stuff, these are the shares. This interaction stuff turns out to be pretty important for some of these sectors. Think about durable goods. It had a share of 13%. But because it's producing capital goods and all this stuff for all the other sectors, right, it gets an extra bang of 0.28. So sure enough, it's it's its multiplier is 0.42, not 0.13. So these sectors really aren't created equally, right? Sectors with the same share can have quite different impacts on aggregate um, uh, value added, right? Because some of them produce, right? Capital goods and things that are used in other sectors. Okay, so, so this is an important conclude, whatever accounting conclusion that comes out of turning the crank in this model, okay? If you apply that right to what we've done here, and I am out of time, so I'm just going to jump right to two final figures. Here's figure take one. Another three, take another three minutes. We're happy with okay. that. Okay. Here's a, here's a figure, right? If you look at this black curve, this is what we just started. This is aggregate value added. Okay, that's the black smooth curve. The blue thing is what you get if you take you know, the trends in sectoral um, labor and TFP and multiply them times these, these multipliers, right? And you can see, you know, obviously you haven't nailed it, but, right, but you've sort of captured, I think, the overall decline. Here, finally, is going to be, if you will, the bottom line, right? I could take each, right, these sectoral, um, uh, the, these uh, sectoral growth rates in, in TFP and labor, right? Some of them were common. Um, some of them were idiosyncratic, right? So here's a crazy table, crazy fig, bit of figure, right? Let me show you it. This is the growth rate in aggregate value added. Okay, so that is, is if you will, is, is data, right? I can do a couple of things. Let me ask how much of this came from common sources? How much of it came from sector specific sources? Looks like the sector specific sources were pretty important. How much of it came from labor? How much of it came from TFP? Now there's no signal extraction here. Right, so there's no statistical modeling going on, right? So there's no uncertainty here, right? Now ask, gee, this common factor in labor, how much a common factor, right? In this, how much of it was the labor common factor? How much of it was the TFP common factor, right? So you can go through a variety of these, of these um, exercises. The common factor explains about 25% of uh, aggregate variability. Okay, so what did I do? I did this. What did I learn? Well, I guess I learned some sectors were more important than other sectors. 
that these common factors explain about 25% of the variability. There were certain sectors that were particularly important, and these are the ones you would have thought of, I think, going in, construction, durable goods, because they're producing capital goods, non-durable goods, because they're producing materials for other sectors, right? And then, you know, there's an important question, once you sort of realize, digging into the details here, right, of what caused what, right, you're now forced to ask, you know, look at the decrease in TFP in construction between 1950 and 1963, which was this giant change in TFP in construction, and ask where did that come from, right? Uh, the durable good TFP decline from, you know, 2000 to 2018, where did that come from, right? Because those are the important things for explaining the reduction in, um, in uh, the growth rate of GDP. So that's what I had. And I apologize to for those of you watching on YouTube that I, I've run over a bit. This is, uh, this, this really is wonderful. Could you take one second and quickly say, so when we do it this way, um, you know, when uh, the, the decline in TFP that we were trying to explain and you were unhappy with how much of it we were able to explain? Yes. And we introduced this machinery, how much better are we explaining it now? I guess it's going back to this picture. Forget about this bottom line. We're explaining, this blue thing is what we're explaining. The, uh -huh. the black is actual, the black smooth thing is actual. The uh -huh. blue is what comes out of this model. Okay. So I guess what I want to see, and eyeballing, it seems like you're nailing it, but I want to see those um, so averages would, that you reported at the very beginning, right? Yeah, so, you know, they end up, they end up, they kind of get the movement, right? Yeah. But not quite, you know, but they're lower. They're sort of like that. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks, folks. Thank, Thank you so you very much, Mark. It was this nice to was be truly here. truly wonderful. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Now I, now I can say I've been to Turkey. <laughs> this doesn't count. Um, <laughs> you know, um, in fact, uh, you know, we're often operating. Um, I have to tell you, we learn much from Princeton's uh, frequently asked questions about how to go back to classes, which we are back. Um, so, uh, you know, whenever you are willing to travel, we're happy to host you and looking forward to it. Perfect. Thanks, Rafet. Okay. Thank See you, you Mark. See you. Okay. Bye-bye.